special thing coming up, recap, uh, codon usage, the next generation sequencing sort of uh, cuts out randomly and then builds large genome assembly machines or sequencing machines uh, that can now sequence many thousand people. Uh, there are very, very, very large viruses known. So this is not the hit, this is the hit list from six years ago. And there you saw that the largest ones are about as big as bacteria. When you get to these questions in biology about why is something called mini virus, well, why it's called virus is clear. Uh, the mini aspect of it, and I found this one here from Tom Fenchel, uh, that is very interesting. It very much reveals the impeccable logic with which biologists uh, give names that have absolutely only to do with that particular organism or with that particular protein. Um, I mean, this sort of says it all. Uh, so many people who work on name recognition of proteins, they sort of realize the immensity of this problem being that, for instance, the same protein in E. coli and yeast has different names. Why would that be the case? Why could that be the case? Um, let me just, for stories like that, I have to look under because that's where the, the light comes. Okay, so let's go into some background about protein structures and the slides today uh, mostly come from Marco Punta who did his PhD in physics, molecular dynamics simulation of physics, did a postdoc at Columbia University, became a senior scientist at the NICOM Center, became an IAS fellow here at TUM, uh, went to PFAM, uh, in fact was the major release manager of the PFAM database for a few years, uh, went on to the CNRS in, in Paris and now is no longer true, he is now at the International Cancer Institute of Cancer Research, ICR in London. Uh, and happens to like, do you know, do you know, do you recognize what this is? Is that a mango? Nope. Oh, that would be cool. <laughs> I, I, I happen to love mango. Yeah. And a uh, mango of that size, wow, that would be something. <laughs> uh, no, we, we, this, this is something uh, that we actually picked up. So this here is in, in New York that we picked up on a walk in Harlem uh, from a street vendor. What is it? It's a coconut. It's a green coconut. So you can actually just open it like that. So they, 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 they do that on the street, they hack it, and then essentially it's water. Uh, if you haven't had that before, essentially it's water that is a little bit colored and has a little bit of coconut taste. So in Brazil or in, in countries where, where they do that, in some African countries I've had it too, uh, so they put them into a freezer and then, then they hack them and then you get this, are we online? Um, <laughs> Yes, we have to cut that out. Um, anyway, so really tastes good. And he loves coconut. Um, thanks also to slides uh, from Andrea Schaffans, who did the Aquaria server. So again, today we're going to talk about protein structure, how bonds and energies, I'm going to slip through it. We are not going to go into 3D comparisons and but we're going to go on Thursday directly into alignments. Um, and today is a lot about reality and images. What's that? Any association? I mean, unless, you, so for those of you who are new to my lecture, if you knew the answer, it would be boring, right? This, this kind of questioning is for you to come up with association or guessing or intuition, scientific intuition, that is what these questions are about. This is just a painting, like in a, so it's really only association. What is it? What do you associate with it? Nothing? Uh, houses on hills, like maybe like a little village. Some trees no. going through it. No, 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 no. This is exactly, I believe, what it is. Georges Braque, houses, uh, Lestac, village, trees, uh, mountain hills, exactly, right? Uh, that is an image of a cell. The important part of this image here is it kills this idea that the cell is, in fact, this is mycoplasma, uh, kills the idea that the cell essentially is a bag full of water 
with some parts in it and surrounded by some lipid in this particular case, which is the membrane, right? The cell is not that, it's very densely packed. So you think about a cell more like a watch, right? Everything interacts really in a touching way. This is counterintuitive because proteins fold in water. So, in fact, everything happens in a cell because proteins are surrounded by water, but tiny layers of water, right? That's, it's not really the bag full of water. It's just there's, uh, everything on the surface of, of, a, of a protein is humid. There's a layer of water. Yes, it can sort of somehow float, but the way proteins interact is much more clockwork-like. Uh, by the way, this is a larger eukaryotic cell. What is that? As an object. They're still looking. Shoot. Oh, come on. Protein with a couple of domains. It looks like cool. domains, right? Yes, to to totally, totally close. Uh, what you still don't quite understand, uh, see, so every sphere here is an amino, is an amino acid, is a residue. Um, now, what you don't quite see is the symmetry of the object. So you say domains or units. Uh, if I show you a slightly different representation, just the same image, the same, not the same image, the same protein underneath with a slightly different coloring. That's all that changes here. I have the same coordinates. All I do is I put rods in particular places. These rods here represent helices, particular segment structure segments that we talk about. Uh, again and again in the lecture later, uh, but these rods immediately show you the symmetry. So you immediately suspect that in fact what you see here is two somehow similar subunits. In this particular case they have to be identical. Identical as in this case of the alcohol dehydrogenase, NEH, where you have in fact these two units here that come together and they are a homodimer means you have two identical subunits, two identical versions of the same proteins coming together in order to be functional. So you need the same thing twice, okay? What's that? Yes, we absolutely need some... Uh, this is not, a pro not, not directly uh, obvious what it is, so we need some association here. I think it looks kind of maybe a folded blanket somehow. Folded blanket, okay, fair enough. A <laughs> clown. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, is he dancing? Well, no, no, you see, it's just his face, it's like a portrait, because at the bottom you see the ruffle, you know, that classic jester ruffle thing around the neck. And then you see like the triangle center of the space and the tussled hair on top. Cool. Really cool. And he had mango for breakfast. Uh, yeah. This is really cool. Uh, okay, something else? I can, I can see the ruffles. And in fact, I believe this is also what uh, Thomas sees as the blanket, yeah? Something else? Just throw some things at me that, that you sort of see. Just say it. Because I'm still not, I'm, I'm fishing for something and I still don't get it. And I'm, I would be surprised if nobody really sees it. Just, just. No? Nothing? Maybe like lots of triangles? Yes, that is what physically it is, right? <coughs> uh, there is some triangle. At least you can, can clearly put triangles into this. Uh, but what's the association? What, what, there's some, uh, this in particular case is an artist. The artist's rendering of something. What does the artist want to convene with that rendering or that ver vision or version or uh, that image? The artist is trying to express something. What could it be? It's just a self-portrait. So it's a way of... Okay, if, if, it, were, if, if it were self-portrait, uh, I do see that you're sort of biased with their clown, but how... how, outside, how, how outside of the clown, how, how do you believe if... The, uh, what would the... If the artist, if the artist saw this as a self-image, what is his feeling of him, or he, her feeling, or his feeling of himself? It's a him, his feeling of himself. Is he sad? Is he tired? Is he discombobulated? <laughs> <laughs> 
it's a folded blanket again. Yeah, an artist has a folded blanket. Um, okay. Um, so, hmm? oh, a soccer player. So, fair enough, My, but the problem is, yeah, they, I'm, I'm not sure, maybe the, the clown is closer to the soccer player. Uh, the clown is closer to the image, uh, but the point is, so it's a soccer player, and I'm going to show you the, the sort of explanation in the, in the next image, because it's an image of an image. Mm -hmm. uh, but the main thing that I was fishing for, that I unfortunately this didn't get, is this word dynamism here. Uh, and that is the image. That's the photo that triggered that image. That photo is of a football player, of a soccer player, of somebody who was a very good player, was a very dynamic player. Now, the, the point that I mean here by this analogy is, this is a 2D image, and if you knew this player, you would recognize the name. Not knowing this player, if you wouldn't know anything about soccer, you would not at all be able to see is that a good player or not? Okay, surrounded by a lot of blue ones, so maybe there are a lot of blue ones around him because sort of they all all attack the same guy. So maybe this is a good guy. But what you absolutely do not see in this frozen image is the degree to which he moves, and that I understand in this room did not go through very well. But in many groups. This image sort of people talk about explosion, talk about energy, talk about fire, talk about some movement, talk about something that is not frozen. The blanket idea is, is frozen. Uh, and this image would portray for some people, as so is the association that many people have from this, is energy, is dynamism. And that is not quite what is in there. So you may argue this is reality. Because this is clearly a 2D image and you recognize the name of the guy. But it does not allow you, if you don't know anything about football, to recognize that it's a game that has a lot of movement or has a lot of energy. While this one, if somebody said, this is the title, okay, maybe you would have recognized that there is some sort of fire energy in this game. Uh, and okay, soccer, so you know, fire over soccer. So the, the artist believes that soccer is in a dynamic play. And that is in there. Uh, and it's not in here, unless you know something about soccer. So what I'm trying to say here, those are two different realities. None of them really is a reality. And those are two different images of reality. What is the real reality? None of those gives the real reality. Both of those are images. Both of those are focused on different aspects of the reality that lies underneath. And the same is true for proteins. In this particular version of a protein, I look at beta strands, these arrows here, and I have, in fact, one arrow for every single residue. What I show in this one here is an NMR structure, an NMR structure, nuclear magnetic resonance structure, where you, in fact, do not have one structure, but you have one, two, three, four, so every trace here is one different structure. And you see that some places there's a lot of difference, and some places they all fall into the same strand here. So that tells you something about where the protein moves more up here, where it moves less here, okay? So this is a different version of the same image. This is it. Both of those give you different aspects of that reality, okay? Uh, and this is what I'm trying to make the point here: uh, that whatever we look at on the following slides, I'm going to show you a few ideas about energies. They are, as well as these images, just approximations. The energies that we see are not reality. They are images. They are simplifications. Okay, just like those images, like photos. Uh, and none of them really reveal the truth. The constituents of proteins are amino acids. Amino acids have a backbone. They have a side chain. Uh, you join them together by essentially bonding the side chain in a so-called peptide bond. Uh, that's a covalent bond. And in, in fact, for this bond, again, you have an attractive and a repulsive force. How do you picture this? You can picture this as sort of these uh, spheres that are separated by something in between, that is the bond. And then you can sort of picture them as large spheres that overlap. So the bond, it's something that is inside these overlapping spheres, and you can picture it as sort of this bone thingy here that is surrounded by these electron density maps that illustrate essentially where the electron is moving. 
right? So this is a probability graph, uh, a probability for finding the electron, which essentially also the probability graph is the we picture this or we imagine this as the movement of the electron. It's not a probability presence of the electron, it's something that sort of describes how the electron moves at some particular point of time. Again, let's not talk about quantum mechanics here, but it, in principle, at some point, I could hold the, the electron and say it's here. And then it's here, it's here, it's here. Again, I cannot do that uh, because of the Heisenberg principle. But uh, that's not the point here. Those are different versions of reality again. The polypeptide chain is formed by sort of uh, putting up these uh, backbones or com connecting these backbones, uh, having the side chains. And when you build up the chain here, what you see is these side chains are the ones that sort of stick out. So they form a chain, side chains are sticking out. Uh, the way they form chains is there are in particular planes, so you move particular planes with respect to one another. And that brings us to this idea of the chemistry again. In the uh, covalent bond, what we see is we, we have the electrons that uh, repulse each other, the protons that repulse each other, the electrons and the protons that attract each other. So you have a bunch of uh, opposing forces that uh, are joined into some sort of simple potential, or we perceive that as a simple potential. There is some point where the attraction is the highest. Beyond that, you have, have the positive repulsion. Uh, above that, you have the attractive force, and that is why there is some sort of optimal length. And within that optimal length, you will see some movement. Okay. Um, for the double bond, the energies are slightly different. Uh, the way they are oriented is slight, are slightly different. Then there are sort of polar bonds where you have one side of this bond being uh, charged uh, positively, one side negatively, uh, forming a dipole that again leads to an attractive force. Ionic attraction would be essentially the closer you get, the closer you are. And then we sort of have an unknown bonded Leonard Jones potential where you essentially have a potential that looks like that. Uh, the terms of size, the unbonded part is here, the ion interactions are here, hydrogen bonds are here, so there's one tenth of sort of an ionic bond. Uh, there are salt bridges that actually have both, they have ionic and uh, hydrogen bonds in it, and then a pi, pi interactions. Uh, oh, uh, this should have been one slide, I'm sorry for the animation. There are in fact metal complexes also forming. Uh, I wanted to go through this much faster than I have the animation here. Uh, ultimately, all of this leads to features. So we are putting features on particular, biophysical features on particular amino acids because we think about the energy underneath the interaction. Features could be positive charge. That's the simplest kind of feature you can attach to it. So uh, lysine and arginine are two positively charged residues, they're two negatively charged residues, glutamic and aspartic acid. Uh, and then there are a few polar residues. Uh, again, so there's, there's a split of the positive and the negative parts. Uh, what I'm missing on this one here is the animation for the hydrophobic. Uh, the hydrophobic, hydro, water, phobic, uh, stay away from it. So essentially, hydrophobic residues are the ones that try to be inside of a protein. Hydrophilic, fill is friend, uh, are the ones that try to be next to water because on the outside of a protein is water. And then ultimately, the way you see that is a protein essentially on the outside has a hydrophobic, hydrophilic residues, on the inside, hydrophobic residues. So the inside sticks together, the outside wants to be close to water, right? Uh, now, I said, you take a protein, you throw it into solvent, it adopts a unique three-dimensional structure. That called, is called folding. That step, how long does it take for a protein to fold? So we take a typical small lysosome, uh, small protein, you throw it into a solvent, it adopts uniquely its three-dimensional structure all by itself, doesn't need anybody to help them. How long does it take? Ballpark. Any idea? If I told you it takes days, would be happy with that? Could that be? Could not be, right? Would be bad for our body if every protein folding would take days. If I told you it takes hours, also cannot be because it's still too long. If I told you it takes minutes, 
Well, now we're getting into the point. Some proteins do take minutes. Most proteins do take much shorter. So most proteins fold in sub-minutes. In, in, it can be seconds. Uh, most of the collapse, the, in, the initial collapse is picoseconds, nanoseconds, uh, parts of seconds. The real folding is many seconds. Uh, ballpark from most proteins. Okay, so that's the ballpark timing. Uh, so, which is fairly rapid, uh, but it is something that is not rapid in the sense of instantaneous. Uh, now, uh, the, the question that I didn't follow up on here: uh, if if you just assumed that you have hydrophilic and hydrophobic residues, nothing else. Forget about charge. Let's assume we have only two amino acids. One is hydrophobic and the other one is hydrophilic, you string them up in a computer and since you have only two, you can actually really fold proteins, right? So they are real proteins, but the complexity now is uh, much, much simplified and you can actually really attack that problem. Would that fold? So if you had sort of a random uh, subset of uh, residues that, you, of course it would not fold if it's all hydrophilic. It would not fold if it's all hydrophobic. So there would be some issues. But if you sort of have some mixture, would that thing adopt some, somehow a sphere? Would that fold? I do not mean adopt this unique three dimensional structure or look like a protein. This is not what I mean. But would it be something that would sort of be round, spherical, or something that sort of adopts a condensed shape? And the answer is yes. I think it would. What is it? Because you need a certain amount of distance to get from the hydrophobic to the hydrophilic. Exactly. So it, it can't be completely random. There needs to be. Absolutely true what you say, Paul. So, but then my my question was more more generic. Would you need any additional information? And you saying your answer to that is one way to read your your answer is to say, well, you need somehow a fraction. So you need somehow to speak. You cannot have. Uh, the a philic phobic. I know uh, what. Well, what you like five phobic, one philic, five phobic. Those were all concentrated to the center, and the one philic would be completely out of place. It would try to go to the outside, but it's completely surrounded by phobic. It would push against it. So not. Let, 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 let me answer my own question. So you could fold proteins only with hydrophobic hydrophilic, but then you could actually test. And that's your po it's, it's your uh, answer. Then you could actually, if that is the case, then you can actually test what is the how do I have to space them? Uh, you could test well what fraction can be hydrophilic. Uh, what is the distance? How much space do you actually need? How long would these fragments have to be in in order to somehow fit? And sort of you immediately see the, intu the intuitively simple uh, statement is uh, at least. Somehow, if 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 you are he, if you are here with a hydrophobic, uh, you and say it's one, two, three, and then you are sort of getting to a hydrophilic, right? So the shortest path to the surface is here. If the hydrophilic is less than three residues away from you all the time, then somehow it wouldn't quite optim optimally fit, right? <laughs> and these kind of conditions you could actually uh, simulate and explore with the computer, and that's exactly what people do. Uh, so that is a model, a very simplified model of protein folding. Mike Levitt, for instance, uh, is one of the people who, who uh, as a toy problem, worked on that and, and sort of showed that clearly objects with these simple features would sort of fold. Um, Okay, we are getting into micro microscopic substructures. Uh, so one way I answered what is a protein is it's a sequence. Here's an ATPase, is simply a string of amino acids. Uh, as one definition of uh, protein, another way of saying this is a protein, it is something that adopts a certain conformation. Where often you refer to this as the primary structure, is a misnomer, so it's, a, it's a 1D string, a sequence. Then there's sort of what people call a secondary structure, tertiary structure, uh, and quaternary structure. And this is very misleadingly often called as 1D, 2D, 3D, 4D. It's very misleading, and I'll get back to that uh, again at some point in the future. Uh, but Simply put, secondary structure is a 1D feature, essentially. Uh, in the sense that you can say that one particular residue here is in a helix. 
So you can put an H to a residue, you write it as a string. So essentially this is 1D, in, in terms of information content, is 1D information. This is a string, this is sort of essentially a string. This is not at all. It's a 3D object. You can possibly write that in 2D, uh, but this is 3D. The quaternity interaction is simply an interaction between two different proteins, which still is a 3D interaction. It's in terms of information content, there's no difference between this one and that one. Both, essentially, in both cases, you essentially have coordinates in, th in a three-dimensional space, right? Um, but anyway, so uh, proteins have these sort of substructures, and again, secondary structure is the simplest. Uh, they are formed through dihedral ang angles, and the, the hydrodynamic angles are such that you form this alpha helix, alpha, uh, why do you believe it's called alpha helix? There was somebody called Linus Pauling who uh, published a bunch of papers in PNAS and essentially he l had an index or counted the structures that he proposed, the secondary structure, the alpha helix, the beta strand. Uh, so essentially he had alpha, beta, gamma, delta and he proposed a bunch of secondary structures. Uh, incidentally, uh, two of those are the ones that we know today. Um, and two of those got him the Nobel Prize. There were others that he proposed that have never been observed, that do not exist. Um, right. Uh, if, if, if two of eight are right, you get a Nobel Prize. Um, so we have to really say, he predicted them before anybody had ever seen a protein structure, right? So it was a remarkable achievement. Um, anyway. The beta strands are forming so-called sheets uh, where this is one piece of the chain, this is another piece of the chain that forms hydrogen bonds between them. Uh, in this particular case, can you see the secondary structure? Can somebody tell me whether the helices, beta strands, both, none of the, the two? It's really complicated. If you sort of show the chain with less detail, all you do now is instead of having one ball of a bunch of balls per, per amino acid, so all you do is the backbone position, and you begin to sort of see shape. You still don't quite necessarily, well, you begin to see this is sort of a helix, maybe this is sort of a helix, uh, now maybe you need a little bit more of an eye to see more, but all you now need to add is a little bit of coloring, and you can convince yourself immediately, ah, yeah, right, uh, the red one are the helices, the yellow one are the strands, and it becomes quite obvious. Uh, and again, sort of this is just, there's no information added here. Well, color is an information. Uh, but this is just a slightly different way of looking at it. Um, so one important aspect behind it is the Ramachandran idea. Uh, the Ramachandran, in fact, another uh, important per person in the, in the field of protein structure, uh, who was a physicist in his background, or an electrical engineer in the, initially, went to the Cavendish laboratory to do crystallography, and then protein crystallography here uh, of collagen initially, uh, and hypothesized that there would be only a set of angles between two different side chains possible. Okay? That in fact, if we sort of looked at the entire space uh, of possible side chains that we observe, uh, and that is from his original publication, then what we would see is areas that associate with the beta strand, alpha helix, and sort of some, some other areas, but they would not be highly densely populated. In fact, that most of the aminas, or most of this, the backbone angles that we would observe are densely packed into one of these major secondary structure segments. Today, if we sort of replot this, then simply the way you have so many outliers that most likely you would see most of that here somehow populated uh, and you would see this is just black uh, if you plotted this in 3D you would see this is a huge skyscraper but you would still today most likely see that this entire thing here is somehow gray uh, where I believe the density would still be the same uh, okay 
So there are two different ty or many different types of cartoons. Uh, one I already showed you, the rods uh, for the alpha helices. Another one I also showed you, the arrows. The arrows have the additional pro advantage. They show you very well how the chain is actually curving. Uh, and they show you the direction their directionality from end to C, from uh, one end of the protein to the other end. Uh, Diazofit formation I'm not going to go into. Uh, so here's another point. We have proteins that span from 30 residues to 35,000 residues. Does that mean that there must be substructures or sub-regions or that there must be some uh, I'm talking about domains. What do you, do you associate with the word domain in terms of proteins? Have you heard that? Have you heard about protein domains? What do you associate with it? What do you picture a protein domain? A part of a protein where you have a function, the structure, uh, or the sequence is conserved and where it seems to depend a bit on the field you're in. Different fields seem to have different preferences there, or all three of them. So let's begin with the, with the, with the last thing you said, Kira. Uh, different fields, and let, let me sort of rephrase that it's in, a, in a way that you're not, you may or may not quite mean. Uh, different fields have different answers to the question what a domain is. Yeah. Okay? So that is clearly the truth. Um, when we so we are predicting in this lecture it goes about the prediction of uh, is about the prediction of protein structure. So we're talking about structural biology, and when structural biology is typically associated with the domain. Some of the features that you said, it's a unit that has a feature with a similarity in function between two different things. You said conserved. Conserved means two things. Conserved means you see it in different organisms the same domain. And when you see it in different organisms, you assume it has a similar function and it clearly has a similar structure. That is all true for structural biology. There's, not, there's an additional way of thinking about it. We think about it as if we take out a domain from a protein, we throw it into soil and it adopts a unique three-dimensional structure. If you take half a domain, it would not reliably fold. Or if you take one and a half domains, it would not reliably fold. So the domain is the unit that itself just is the right thing that folds. Okay? Essentially, if you think about it, so it's not easy to do this experiment, but people have done that. Uh, for some proteins, we can easily do that experiment. It's not easy to do that for all proteins, but for the proteins for which we can do that, is we could simply ask, what's the speed of folding? And is the speed of folding in increasing or decreasing if I change the domain. And ultimately the answer is that the domain that is sort of the native domain is the fastest to fold. If you put something on top, it gets slowed down. If you put something less, it gets slowed down or it doesn't work at all. Okay? So the domain is the element that folds the fastest or the quickest or is clearly folding independently. That's one way of thinking about that. Right? Now, if you think about it that way, and when we go back to the genome structure, in the genome, now structure, the word structure is a little bit misleading, uh, but what we see in the genome is there are exons and there are introns. As you know, only the exon is taken to actually make the protein sequence. This induced in people the idea that in fact exon relates to domain. So one exon essentially is one domain. And that is absolutely, there are cases where that is true. Of all, the statement is not true. Exons do not relate to what we see as domains. Uh, there are many cases where domains cut right through exons. Uh, uh, domains are, so exons are part of domains and exons, so domains are shorter and so they're, they're domains that make, are made up of many exons, and they're uh, exons that are sort of part of, one exon is part of two domains. And that is, again, length, exon length independent. Uh, so the exon clearly is not the unit for uh, the protein folding universe. It's a different uh, reality. Now, say you saw an example where you have in one organism protein A and a protein B, and in another organism, Domain A and Domain B. What would you say to a case like that? 
What would you su suspect may have... Uh, would that tell you anything about A and B? Yeah? Maybe they are like uh, pre or like ancestors? So A and B may be ancestors. This is certainly, this is true. So yes, we would in fact immediately assume that that is sort of an ancestral version, that is sort of a more modern version, that the organism P2 is later in evolution than P. Typically we would assume that, yes. That's the first one. And then, what else? Something else we would assume. Yeah? Maybe protein A and B have like a functional component which is similar, so they combine? In the most extreme way, we would tend to argue that this may indicate that protein A and B intact. And that, in fact, putting it into the same protein uh, uh, makes it simpler to make sure that they really meet at the right moment. They express together, so they don't have to meet, they're ready together, and if it is an important interaction. And there are many cases where we see that. Okay? The two proteins that in one organism are separate genes, and in a later organism, evolutionary later organism, are one gene or one gene, and they interact. Uh, again, this is not always like that. Uh, and most proteins for which uh, we know that they interact, we cannot find these cases. But there are many cases like that known. In fact, for most cases, we can see the simple match. We really find out that these proteins then indeed interact. But that gives you some begin of an idea that we sort of put domains or move domains in evolutionary space around to in fact sort of add new features or combine in a way so that domains actually are created by sort of adding new features to proteins. Right? Uh, and that is in 3D looks like this. So you have one protein that is a little bit bigger, one protein that's a little bit smaller, and sort of you may suspect that it fits into that one. In the slide here from Christine Orengo, you see for these six proteins here that every one of these blurbs here is one particular domain. And there you already see these are long proteins here with many domains. So the, sh the, the fewest here is with six domains, with six blurbs. Uh, and what you see is that they they all sort of use the same kind of domains, but they're completely different by simply arranging these domains in different ways. Uh, having different number of repetitions, having the yellow appear at sort of different points, uh, there is something that they all have in common, uh, which is not only the set of domains, but they all have in common that there's this purple one here in the beginning, and then there's the yellow triangle. Uh, but you immediately see in this sort of domain universe that there is another way of sort of understanding proteins. Now, I'm showing here a way that I will communicate in the next se sessions about alignments, uh, which is we have six proteins, typically from six different organisms, and this is the way the sequence runs here, and the fact that I put a, uh, a black part here and a black part here means that protein B is similar to protein A exactly in the region where they overlap. Okay? So the way to read this image here is to understand that in the beginning of B, B is similar to sort of the middle of A and the similarity extends to the end of A and then B has something that is on top and that is different. Uh, and the same way here for all of these. Now if you saw this image, would you see domains in this image? How many domains would you see? Two. So one way of seeing that is you see these two main domains here. Now you may actually argue, actually I see at least four domains because I see clearly that this is at least one. This is at least one. Maybe it's another one. Uh, and now maybe we even see five because there's something in between. Now there's something in between here. Could be an additional loop. It could just be something that is actually a small, small a short embellishment or a small addition, a short addition, but not something that if you cut it out, it falls on itself. Okay? So we don't quite know. We, but at least it gets you an idea how from these images we sort of could find domains. So this, this could be that one, that could be that one. In fact, they could even be similar to each other. Um, now, when we look at this image and try to sort of build uh, domain, domains from an alignment of all proteins against all proteins, unfortunately, we often see that it's a little bit more like this. 
So that you cannot quite see where the cut is, because here you cannot see at all where the cut is, right? Uh, because everybody sort of adds a little bit, there's nothing that all have in common. This is, we see, what I call dream here, is something that we do see in nature, and lots of it. And we construct a lot of domains from it. But in many cases we see something like that. The larger the database grow, the more we actually see these letters. Uh, and that is sort of a limit to, to what we can do by staring at evolution. Evolution did it, we just don't quite know how to interpret it right. Uh, so if that image really is completely the truth, then maybe evolution does not move in terms of domains. Uh, and then once in a while it sort of hits on a domain and then we create a new domain. But actually the way it moves is in, in, in tiny fragments that are not really domain-like. Uh, the image is odd. Um, so, longer proteins are rarer than short ones, so the way this, this statement is made uh, clearly is true. Uh, is it true that prokaryotic proteins are shorter than eukaryotic proteins? This is, for instance, a statement that you commonly hear. Uh, not only commonly here, but also find in textbooks. Uh, so this is an old image, uh, it's now 19 years old, that pro eukaryotes are blue, uh, green are prokaryotes, uh, red are archaea. You see archaea and prokaryotes are sort of similar. You also see that essentially most of the bulk where prokaryotes and eukaryotes are is the same. So the eukaryotic and the prokaryotic bulk all sit somewhere in this sort of sub-500 residue part. Most of them are somewhere here. And most of them, here is the, the 500 residue point, you see 70% uh, of the eukaryotes and 85% of the prokaryotes roughly, or 87% of the prokaryotes, are in that realm until 500. Okay. All of this. Now, the biggest difference really is for the very long ones. For the very long ones is the ones, I don't know, wherever you put your, your hand, longer than 1,500, longer than 1,000. Uh, for the eukaryotes, this number, longer than 1,000 residues is about 70%, 7 of the genome. And for the prokaryotes, it's sort of 1% of the genome. So there is some important difference, but overall, for most of the proteins, eukaryotes and prokaryotes, in fact, do not differ in length. So this issue that I showed you before, that you put two proteins together and then you gain something in evolution. While it is true, it's not something that we see. It's not that later in evolution means longer, okay? This is clearly what this one shows. Um, some proteins are multi-domain, uh, most are not. Is that true? Or any of these three here? Is any of them true? Are them all true? Is none of them true? Let's begin with the first one. Some proteins are multi-domain. Most are not. Are we talking about absolute percentage of proteins like in, in your body? Uh, I'm not entirely sure what you mean by that word, Paul. Uh, so what I mean now, we have 20,000 proteins in human. So that fraction of 20,000 in humans. Are they all unique or? 20,000 unique. Uh, uh, so we have 20,000 proteins are that are not, so not, not, that are such that no pair of those is identical to the other one. In that sense, they are unique. And if we looked at the 150 million in uh, PFAM, would essentially most of those have one domain or would have most of those have more? Any, any answer? Uh, most multi-domain proteins have more than three domains. No. Uh, there are more proteins with three domains than with one. Mm. So we cannot, we can clearly not have a yes to all three of them. That, that, that becomes clear at that point. Can anybody throw their weight into any of those? No? Okay, let's look at some answers. 
uh, so auto identify domains so the way we did it initially here and there's still no clear clear solution for that but essentially that's what people do is first you look at all the proteins for which you know the three dimensional structure so if that is your protein here you want to cut it into domains first you align it to something where you know the three dimensional structure of from three dimensional structure you know the domain because it's the most compact subunit of the three dimensional structure you cut. Then there is a fraction where you know from PFAM that is a region that has an independent function that is used often in evolution. You assume this is sort of similar to, to a structural information. I don't have structural information here so I cannot use it but that's the second best thing I can do because people actually have hand curated these families and know where the function is so we cut. Uh, in this particular case that would leave us uh, with, with this fragment and this fragment here and say in this fragment here again we have what I showed you before so we have an evolutionary example where we see a bunch of proteins that are here a bunch of proteins that are here uh, maybe some that have both and we assume that again this is two proteins uh, two domains uh, so we, in this particular case if we found a case like that we would cut uh, and in this particular case we would have one two three four five domains and then sort of this shows you essentially the percentages but let's just go down to here number of domains fraction blue we believe all proteins green the proteins for which are know the three-dimensional structure and you see that the answer for green and blue is very different for green it looks as if 60% of all the proteins have one domain while for the blue you immediately see that in fact uh, most blue ones are only sort of 30% of the blue ones have one that means 70% or more than 70% in this particular case have more than one uh, have two or more uh, and there was this question is three as, as high as one so in this image it would not quite be but not that different two clearly is higher than, than one now which one should we trust? the green or the blue? the green is much more reliable the blue is full of guessing yeah, but I mean, there's a lot of bias in PDB. Why? Because you only have ones that you can crystallize easily. And why? Can you not crystallize the blue ones? Well, because I mean, PDB is, is from those that people have done uh, X-ray crystallography. Yeah. And actually got the 3D structure. So that's bias based on which ones we actually investigate, which ones we think are interesting, which ones we can even crystallize. I mean, you can't do membranes, you can't do intrinsically disordered. You, there's like, and yeah. That's certainly true. Is there something that I said today that already would explain why PDB would be enriched in single domain proteins? They're simpler. Why are they simpler? Oh, because, well, I mean, you, because you need to separate the protein and allow it to fold by itself so that you can get the, so you can get the exactly. crystal structure. Exactly. So if you have a domain, that's so much harder to crystallize yes. and get that lattice. Exactly. Structure. I'll put it differently. So in my answer to Kira's point uh, was that one way to think about a domain is really as the thing that, that folds more fastest and easiest on its own, right? And a single domain folds fastest and easiest. That's why proteins with a single domain is exactly what is enriched because they're easier to crystallize. So put one and one together and that's exactly the bias what you see. Uh, you, you do see more in the PDB of things that are easier to do. You also see more of the things that you find a lot in evolution. And again, these are the things that you find a lot because we assume uh, they, they are folding so quickly that it's easy to put them onto many, many different proteins and there is an advantage to repeat them in evolution again and again. Uh, and that means that the ones we have in the PDB are also the very important ones. The ones in the PDB are the ones that most likely make up most of the space. That's another way of looking at it, yes? I mean, well, that's the follow-up question. So what does it look like, not percentage of all proteins, but percentage of like mass in a, in a human body? No, that, in fact, I, 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 do, not know, I do not know the answer. I have, not, I, have not, I have not seen that, that, the answer to that one. Uh, but this is also not quite giving, so... Um, when, when we now ask, so this is, uh, every domain counts once in this image, right? Uh, now you could sort of count a domain again. You could say, if a protein has 50 versions of that, I count that domain 50 times. And look at the sort of the frequency per, per domain. And that would also look very different. So you're really talking about, I have heat shock proteins, a lot of these. 
I have other proteins that are ubiquitins. There are some proteins I have much more frequent than others. And I do not know how that would map to the domain. But even the first one that I, uh, that I told you would look very different. Because, in fact, we know that the, um, these, these sort of completely biased one domain things here map to almost half of all the sequence space. Okay, that's one way of saying that. Uh, so these are the most popular ones, or the anyway. Okay, but there clearly is most proteins have uh, clearly more than one domain. Uh, this one was not true. Uh, this, there are more proteins with three domains than with one. It's not quite true. I made a mistake here. Uh, three is smaller than than one. Uh, I have to correct that. Uh, and prokaryotes, in fact, what we see here, prokaryotes, in fact, also do not really have more domains uh, than eukaryotes. Eukaryotes are in red and blue. Uh, prokaryotes in red, this is another uh, mistake in the way I annotate that. And you see that these two are parallel. What I show here is number of domains. I call them fragments because we are not sure that they are domains. Uh, and here's the average length of each of these fragments. Uh, and what you essentially see is that the way they enter the one is different between blue and red. But the way the, the slope is between blue and red is the same. So that essentially um, there is a sort of first, if you think about it this way, there's one domain that is longer in the blue than in the red. But once you have this sort of one thing that is longer, the seed, so to speak, all domains that follow have, on average, the same length. And in fact, surprisingly, sort of the first thing is, the first domain is a few 250 to 300 residues long, while all subsequent domains are about 100 residues long. So that, putting these together, means that most domains actually are about 100 residues long. And that, in fact, is what we really believe. Um, uh, okay, now, whoops, what, what was that image? But, but I always thought the average length of a protein was 300 residues. Yes. You carry out, so doesn't that imply that the average but, protein has three domains? Um, <laughs> no. Uh, so so let's, let's, let's begin with a... Let's, let's, let's begin with questioning your first, first statement. Um, with the average length, where did I have the length? When you look at the length distribution, here it is. When you look at the length distribution, so uh, both the, the, the medium and the average is not really meaningful. Uh, as you see with these distributions, they are such that making the statement the average length of a protein is 300 or 400 does not really cut the point, right? The bulk of the distribution, so what you can say is the bulk of the distribution is sort of about 400. Uh, now, th that already m tells you that if the first one is sort of 300 and then one is on, on top of 100, then most of those have two. And that's what you clearly see here, right? And that way your, uh, your rationale works. But it clearly does not work for the longer ones. But ultimately, this is what, what it is. So most of the, the proteins have one relatively long domain and many, many, many shorter ones. Most extreme example of that is titan uh, with 35,000 residues. Uh, most of these domains are very short. Very short, meaning in the ballpark of 100 residues. Um, why did I lose? So. When we cluster proteins, and again, we're going to talk about that, uh, I will cut out most of the, usually I bring a lot of details now about the way structures are assigned at this part of the lecture this year, we'll not do that. I will essentially uh, zoom into sequence comparisons on Thursday. Uh, and what sequence comparisons actually do is they, com they define a distance between all protein pairs using only sequence. You could also do that by using structure, right? You can compare proteins according to their 3D shapes uh, or using only the sequences. Uh, and then essentially you would get sort of a map, you would a distance map. Uh, that distance map is not really giving you proximity, but it gives you distances. 
Uh, sorry, it does not give you distance, it gives you proximity. So you can say everything that is similar to something, but you cannot really say what is not similar. Uh, but ultimately in this map, the next step is clustering. Clustering means you put sort of areas around it and you say these belong together. And this statement belongs together ultimately is something that is biology. That's an interpretation. Okay? We measure sequence similarity and then we sort of see that things that have a similar sequence also have a similar function, have a similar structure. And that then I would call biology. Now there is some sort of grouping that you hope would be existing throughout no matter what you do. So has a similar, if the, the circle is small enough then they will always have a similar function, similar structure and similar similar. And that is not quite true. Okay? Uh, so that really depends on what the fragment is. You can add a loop and you can change the function. You can add, uh, we can change one particular residue and knock out function or structure. Uh, so the grouping always clearly is uh, biology on it. So cells are densely packed, have an inside and an outside, have a membrane. Uh, proteins come on different scales and different function. Uh, in this, so it's a slide from Natasha Wood here, uh, there's a glycoprotein here from the HIV, uh, the HIV envelope and the glycoprotein is trying to recognize the, or the CCR, the receptor here is trying to recognize the HIV virus to act uh, and in particular it recognizes a particular extension, a loop. This loop in our language so far, those are domains here. This loop is an addition. This loop has nothing to do with the domain. Uh, and so far we talked about function being related to the domain. But now the recognition is something that is related to the loop, which is not part of the domain, which is an addition, is an anchor, is a, uh, an addition to that protein. And that part, changing that part, in fact, is exactly how the, the virus is escaping the immune system. So recognizing these loops is what you try to do, uh, in particular this one, particularly v, the so-called V3 loop, and the V3 loop uh, ha again uh, has, uh, binds to glycans, and this binding to glycans has to do with the sequence features and that is what people try to sort of attack uh, with a drug. Okay, Peter Strand.